In the eyes of Tom Fitton, what is the significance of the Department of Justice Inspector General's report, or IG report, on former FBI Director James Comey? Does it exonerate Comey, as the former FBI Director claims? What is the significance of Bruce Orr's interview records, the FBI 302s, with Christopher Steele? What else might be found in other Christopher Steele-related documents? And in the Michael Flynn legal case, why is the prosecution insistent on withholding access to unredacted Bruce Orr 302s and struck page texts? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Today we bring back Tom Fitton, president of Judicial Watch which uses FOIA, or Freedom of Information Act requests in litigation to expose government corruption. We discuss the new IG report and what Tom Fitton describes as Comey's 2017 ambush interview of President-elect Trump. We also explore FBI 302s of Bruce Orr's interviews with Christopher Steele. Michael Flynn's attorney Sidney Powell seeking unredacted documents in her defense of Flynn. Judicial Watch's new discovery on the Hillary Clinton emails, as well as Judicial Watch's lawsuit against sanctuary policies in California. Tom Fitton, excellent to have you back on American Thought Leaders. Good to be with you, thank you. So Tom, you know, last week, this new Inspector General report uh, about James Comey dropped, as they say. Um, tell me what you saw in it. Well, the first thing is, it's really outrageous that the Justice Department has evidently declined to prosecute uh, James Comey for the misconduct and criminality outlined in the IG report. And that's what I see in the IG report. Uh, significant criminality by uh, the FBI director and then fired FBI director James Comey. And, uh, and I encourage everyone to read the IG report because it really explains the coup plotting and thinking of the coup plotters uh, because it's more than a just about whether James Comey took memos on what President Trump was telling him and keeping him at his home and then illegally leaking them and uh, among all those memos was classified information which he shouldn't have had and which he shouldn't have shared, all of which he could have been prosecuted for. Uh, but I thought the biggest aspect of the IG report was the description of Comey's ambush interview or meeting with President Trump or then President-elect Trump in the beginning of 2017. Uh, they had had a meeting a few days before, I think, with the uh, president and the vice president and, other senior leadership, and they talked about the dossier. Right. The salacious and unverified dossier, and those terms are Comey's terms. And they, he said, well, we're going to have to brief President Trump on this, or then President-elect Trump. And uh, the supposed reason for the briefing generally was to talk about Russian interference in the campaign. But it's evident the real reason was to confront him with this dossier, because they were investigating him and they wanted to know what his reaction was. So Comey was playing spy against then-President-elect Trump. And obviously the dossier was fraudulent. They knew it was salacious and unverified, and yet they threw it in his face with the hopes of getting a reaction they, they, they then could use against him. And the report details how Comey goes downstairs and there's a laptop, a secure laptop, waiting in his car, and he immediately begins typing away. Uh, about this, you know, this pre-planned assault on the president. And uh, they, he goes to his office, I guess it was the field office of New York, and he immediately begins a secure video teleconference with uh, his colleagues, including, it looks like, Lisa Page and Peter Strzok. Right. So this was this ambush interview of, of President-elect Trump, and, and it's pretty clear all of Comey's interactions with Trump, because he was memorializing him, uh, were, were part of a spy operation against President Trump to try to get him and destroy him. Uh, that's what the IG report's about. So, however disappointing the prosecution, the failure to prosecute him for keeping those FBI files he had on Trump at his home and then leaking them uh, is, it's as important to know that the FBI director, uh, initially tasked by President Obama, certainly with his acquiescence, was spying on, on uh, President-elect Trump and then President Trump. And then on top of it, he leaks this information as part of a vendetta after he's fired with the hopes of getting a special counsel appointed. And of course, he got his special counsel, his friend Robert Mueller. So uh, it highlights the criminality of, of just how base the criminality was of Mr. Comey. It highlights the corrupt formation of the, independent, uh, the special counsel and it shows that the coup plotting was real. Tom, you know, I, I read some of what 
James Comey's uh, you know response to the report was, and it's almost like we're talking about a. Are we talking about the same report here? I mean, he he was saying it exonerates him. How does this doesn't seem to match up very well with? Well, what that's he said. why it's good for Americans to be able to read this document for themselves. It doesn't exonerate him, and. I don't know why he wasn't prosecuted, but uh, he's lucky he wasn't prosecuted. He should have been prosecuted, uh, but he certainly had FBI files he shouldn't have had. At one point, uh, th I mean, this, this is worth repeating. So he has the FBI over at his home, and he's talking about documents. And he says, well, I got these other documents here. You want them? And they're like, of course we want them. But he didn't tell them at the time that he leaked them. And of course, some of it was classified. So these same people are watching him the next day testify to Congress, and he says, well, I gave him to my friend, Mr. Richmond, who was the professor friend, his designated leaker. Right. And the IG report recounts as the FBI, that the FBI general counsel, upon seeing that, ran down the hall with Peter Strzok, literally ran down the hall with Peter Strzok to go and call Richmond because they knew he had classified information he shouldn't have had and they needed to retrieve it. If anyone else had pulled that with the FBI, played games with whether they had classified information and whether they shared it, and they found out about it, they would have been arrested, and there would have been a raid on their home to figure out what other potential material they had. Uh, so I, I, read, the, read the IG report, read the IG's conclusions. He had documents, he had business, no business hiding, and, and the dishonesty even in dealing with the IG is incredible, because uh, the IG says, why, do you think, why would you think these are personal documents? You were talking to the president about business, uh, you know, even at dinner. And he says, well, yeah, I was there as FBI director, but I was also there as a human being. <laughs> so, I, you know, that's, that's not a credible answer. And, it's, and it, frankly, it just shows me uh, that uh, Comey thought he could do no wrong. Uh, and it's a shame the Justice Department, uh, you know, allows him to continue to think that by refusing to prosecute him. So... It, it, you think so? Is that it for James Comey? Yeah, I, you know, I don't see any further prosecution of James Comey. It would be a pleasant surprise. I mean, to me, this is a straightforward issue. He confessed to leaking the FBI files; they were classified. Uh, he was engaging in this illicit spying on President Trump. I mean, that's that's Spygate in, in, in essence. So the idea that the IG report is going to come up and confirm what we already know that. The FISA warrants were fraudulently obtained, therefore illegally obtained, and new prosecutions will arise out of that. I'd be surprised, but pleasantly so. But that's why Judicial Watch just does, does our work, because uh, even with Comey's uh, IG report, it confirmed with new details what we already knew thanks to Judicial Watch disclosures through the FOIA. The same with the FISA gate. We'll get more details. But there's been reporting, there's been documents we've obtained through FOIA that we'll talk about even with the th uh, from the FBI itself recently uh, that show you there's more than enough to initiate prosecutions now. They don't have to wait for an IG. Uh, they're not going to launch a prosecution immediately upon an IG report anyway. They have to do their own investigation and question people before grand juries and with their lawyers. So uh, I just don't see it happening. Well, you know, speaking of some of these documents, <laughs> there were these uh, uh, 302, uh, FBI 302s uh, uh, from Bruce Orr, you know, uh, actually from Christopher Steele, uh, a lot of them anyway, um, that you released. And can you tell me a little bit about these? Actually, and maybe for the benefit of our audience, what is a 302? We've heard that term brandished around. I don't think everyone knows. Yeah, there are all these acronyms and yeah. for, uh, the numbers of a form that only those of us in Washington know about. But an FBI 302 is a narrative report created by FBI agents or officials about witness interviews or subject interviews. So if you had an interview with me, you go back and write a 302 report describing how the interview takes, took, uh, what happened at the interview. They don't record the interviews. So in many ways, they're kind of a, a shady way of conducting investigations, in my view. Nevertheless, they're the documentary, rev, ev, uh, documentary record of FBI activities and investigations. So we received, because of our lawsuit, the Justice Department and the FBI declassified the 302 reports of FBI interviews with Bruce Orr. Who is Bruce Orr? Senior official of the Justice Department. His wife, Nellie Orr, worked for the Fusion GPS spy ring hired by the Clinton DNC gang. Uh, and uh, Bruce Orr was used as a conduit or a cutout to talk to 
Christopher Steele and Fusion GPS, after the FBI cut, cut Steele off as a paid informant because he was, untrustworthy, he was an untrustworthy leaker. Right. So uh, Bruce Orr, whose wife is working there, is outrageously uses the FBI to continue to launder this dossier information to uh, the FBI. And uh, this is occurring after the president is elected and the first part of his term. And now uh, the 302 show that Bruce Orr told them, look, Christopher Steele is anti-Trump. He was, quote, desperate to stop him. Uh, it's pretty clear that the dossier wasn't panning out. So you have all this garbage dossier information uh, being uh, given to Bruce Orr and then to uh, who's then giving it to the FBI. So you've got it. Of course, Bruce Orr's Justice Department, so you've got DOJ and FBI covered at the same time. Uh, and it talks about them giving them uh, information and taking out, uh, for instance, Nellie Orr was going to give, her, uh, give them her Fusion GPS uh, uh, research targeting Trump. And Orr said, yeah, we were going to do that, and I was going to take out, and they, was, they were planning to take out the Fusion GPS markings from the documents. I see. And just... As if it were from steel, or how, how is that going to work? Uh, why would you want to disguise that unless you were up to no good? So uh, obviously Bruce Orr should never have been put in that position. He was conflicted. It was inappropriate for a senior Justice Department official to be playing spy games with Fusion GPS and Christopher Steele, who was persona non grata over at the FBI as it is. But it's pretty clear the FBI was desperate to get Steele information because it wasn't panning out. I mean, if they had what they needed to get Trump, they wouldn't be using these improper vehicles like or to get access to uh, uh, steel and fusion GPS. And then we get another set of documents showing that Nellie Orr indeed is putting all the material with her husband and he's giving it to uh, the FBI. So all of the dossier material was being laundered not only from Christopher Steele, but from Nellie Orr who was in regular communication with the Justice Department about all things related to Russia, certainly all things related to Trump. So remember, Nellie Orr worked for Fusion GPS, who was paid for by Clinton and the Democratic National Party, the Democratic National Committee. So when you look at the voluminous email traffic between uh, Nellie Orr, Fusion GPS, and Bruce Orr, you make it, it make, it's pretty clear Fusion GPS may as, well, may as well have had an office at the Justice Department and Nellie Orr, with Nellie Orr manning the desk. So, you know, I was reading actually that uh, there was a federal court that actually has ordered the FBI to do more searches on Christopher Steele related documents. So we, we, you, you think there's still more out there, oh, basically, Oh, there is, right? because they cut it off at the time Mueller was hired. I see. So these FBI 302s, they talk about the FBI's efforts to reach out to Steele up until Mueller's hired. Then there's nothing. So the Justice Department and the FBI, incredibly, came and told the court that we shouldn't go there because Christopher Steele has some privacy interests here that need to be protected. And the court said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Search for the documents. You've got 60 days. If you want to try asserting privacy, then uh, you can try asserting privacy uh, 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 redactions or exemptions to withhold information. Uh, but let's find what the documents are and then we can fight about whether you can withhold them or not. They didn't even want to look for them. They're, they're covering, they, they're, they were trying to cover it up and thankfully a court said, no, you got 60 days. So what do you think's in there? Any, any, any? Well, it's any, going to show Mueller's collusion with Steele. I'm convinced that's what it's going to show. Oh, really? Because the FBI began working for Mueller on Russiagate and so that's what's going to show that Mueller was using uh, the shady Steele dossier as well to target President Trump. Wow, that, that 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 would be quite the bombshell, wouldn't it? It would be, but you know we'll see what it, we'll see what happens. Why else would they make such extraordinary do, uh, arguments to cover up or stop uh, this information from coming forward? Yes. If it were if it were good, it'd be released. Right. So, and speaking of three hundred twos, actually, I was an, another thing that has come up is you know Sidney Powell, uh, uh, General Flynn's uh, lawyer. Right. She basically is seeking access to these unredacted Bruce Orr 302s and also Peter Page Strzok texts unredacted. And they're going to extraordinary lengths, it seems, to not provide those. Well, that's the underlying basis of the Flynn prosecution. I don't know why they wouldn't be relevant. I think she has a strong case. 
Uh, what do you think? Why do, why do you think they're so adamant and not uh, providing? Because the Flynn prosecution was corrupt, and I think Sidney Powell understands that, and that's why she's pushing for these documents to expose the level of corruption. You know, General Flynn had every right to talk to the Russian ambassador as incoming national security advisor. He did nothing wrong in talking to them. Uh, I think it's pretty clear he didn't lie uh, during the ambush FBI interview that was improperly obtained by Comey and uh, Andrew McCabe uh, in the beginning of the presidential, uh, in the beginning of President Trump's administration. Uh, that, that whole prosecution has been uh, one ugly mess. Yeah, well, I'm, a lot of people are very curious to see what will, what will come of yeah. that. Are, are there any other documents that you guys are hunting for right now that, that, that we should be aware of? Well, we want the unredacted FISA applications. There's more that can be unredacted or, or declassified. Uh, you know, the big declassified group of records we received was the 302s. Those were, those were secret documents, and they were declassified thanks to Judicial Watch's Freedom of Information Act litigation. It's pretty clear the Justice Department uh, is uh, just slow walking the release of information. The FBI is a, is a complete stonewall. Uh, they are telling us they have page struck records that they don't want to process and turn over to us until 2021. So they've got 13,000 records. They want only, only want to process 500 pages a month. So that would put the complete uh, material out, out until 2021 until we get them. And uh, they don't want to give us text messages, generally speaking. Uh, they, as I said, they were in court trying to protect Steele's privacy. I mean, they are defending Obama and Clinton still over at the FBI and, frankly, the Justice Department. And so what do you think about this uh, new DOJ IG report about the FISA abuse that's, you know, again, should be coming soon? Um, where, where, where are we at with that in your mind? I don't know. I don't know. If it comes out, it suggests uh, that there'll be no prosecutions because the Comey IG report uh, was only released after the DOJ was given a chance to decide whether to prosecute. And... Uh, because I guess the IG was thinking we don't want to release this information because it might get in the way of a prosecution. It may be if we see the DOJ Pfizer report, the IG Pfizer report, the fact that we're seeing it may tell us there'll be no prosecution or prosecutions of anyone related to the illegal spying and targeting and leaking and all of that that took place to try to overthrow the president. And you know another thing that that a lot of people are asking about, and I'm wondering if you have any new thoughts on this, is is the CIA involvement, um, sort of in, you know increasing uh, the, you know some some lines of evidence that suggest the CIA was also involved in all of this in a, in a deeper way. Do you have any any, any thoughts on well, that? Well, you know, it looks like uh, one of the associates uh, with uh, Stefan Halper was a potentially a CIA person. John Brennan, the former head of the CIA under Obama, uh, he's been a big cheerleader for the coup cabal uh, and uh, was involved in uh, that ambush interview of President-elect Trump in January that we talked about earlier in the interview. Uh, the CIA has been largely protected from too much scrutiny here, and they've obviously been withholding information uh, in, to, uh, in a way that the DOJ and the FBI haven't been able to. So you I mean overall here, Tom? You you don't seem too you don't seem like you're expecting to see uh, a lot of prosecution happening here. I would be a, it would this. be a change. I mean, it would be a dramatic reversal of. Let me let me put it another way. Past experience tells us nothing will happen, but maybe something will happen. Maybe Attorney General Barr uh, will uh, push for prosecutions over the objections of the deep state. Uh, remember, the Justice Department is run by a handful of Trump appointees surrounded by smart but dishonest, liberal, left-leaning, left partisan Democrats. That's the Justice Department. So to get any prosecutions out of that agency from the pure career civil servants, oh, that's going to be tough if it's going to be targeting um, the leadership of the democratic foreign policy world uh, and intelligence system.
Well, that's why we're doing the work in the meantime, uh, because nothing's going to happen if we don't know about the, we don't know the full truth of the corruption. And so we're convinced by getting the information out, uh, it can contribute to the public pressure for full accountability and maybe prosecutions. A court has ordered new discovery around the Clinton emails, the thing that the whole case that, that right. Judicial Watch started. And I, I, I'm wondering if you could tell, tell us a little bit more about where that's going. And I understand there's actually a, a you know, you, you intend to depose Hillary Clinton. Well, uh, we hope to. Oath. Yeah. We hope to. Mm -hmm. Well, the court already had granted us discovery. This was a case where we asked about the Benghazi talking points, the infamous talking points that lied to America uh, under the Obama administration about the terrorist attack on Benghazi, where they said it was a video and not a terrorist attack. So we noticed there were no Clinton emails. And so we pushed on that. And it was that litigation that led to the disclosure, uh, in our view, of the Clinton email uh, issue. Now, the court was interested in granting us discovery to find out whether Mrs. Clinton used that system to avoid FOIA, whether they were trying to game the court and shutting the case down before they disclosed the Clinton emails to us, and exactly where other emails might be that would be responsive to our FOIA and need to be searched. So he granted us discovery. We deposed already 10 or 11 uh, witnesses, and the witnesses and the documents we've uncovered show the Obama White House was involved in the cover-up, the State Department knew full well about the Clinton emails, but were, was cagey, to put it charitably, and was misleading and lying about uh, what they knew and when to the courts and to requesters for documents that would be impacted by her email system. Uh, that Mrs. Clinton was warned repeatedly about her email use, but obviously she continued to do whatever she wanted to do. So uh, the court wanted a status update, and we came back and said, this is what we found. We've raised more, we've asked, uh, we found more information that's raised additional questions, and the court agreed with us and uh, granted us new witnesses. I think there are um, about eight or nine witnesses, and Mrs. Clinton and her top aide, Cheryl Mills, we were also requesting to question in person under oath, and uh, he gave them 30 days to respond and to uh, oppose, presumably, what we're trying to do. So that was a great victory. So, so it's significant new discovery into trying to figure out who knew what and when about the cover-up. But what was really outrageous is we were opposed. This is just two weeks ago in federal court by the Justice Department and State Department. We said that we should get no additional discovery, was defending the State Department's handling of that FOIA cover-up, that Clinton email cover-up, and obviously didn't want Hillary Clinton or Cheryl Mills, Cheryl Mills to answer any more questions. Incredible. Well, that's uh, re remarkable when, when, you, when you put it that way. Why, you know, there's a lot of people out there that I've been kind of, you know, tracking to sort of public opinion around this, around this issue. And there's a lot of people who are basically saying, enough already. Why do you keep bringing up these Clinton emails and so forth? But why is this so important to you? Well, the court wants answers. So that's why it's important. There was corruption of the courts, it looks like. And uh, we have a right to the documents under the law and what Mrs. Clinton was doing, and she knew. Look, we've had a long history of Mrs. Clinton. She knows what Judicial Watch does. She knows her emails would have been subject to disclosure under FOIA, and she tried to hide them. We want to know what she was trying to hide. We have a right to the documents under law, and it's more important than ever that we do this work, especially since the Justice Department not only has conducted and the FBI sham investigations that protected her from the potential criminal cross consequences of her crimes, but are actually act still defending her. Uh, what's outrageous is that we are s many of these issues could have been solved and we could have been had answers years ago, but we've been fought every step of the way, either by the uh, cover-up of Mrs. Clinton most directly or the Justice Department and uh, fighting us every step of the way. And it hasn't changed with the new administration. Uh, the deep state is still running things over at the Justice Department. I think Attorney General Barr is a good guy. Uh, I admire his, what he has to say about Russiagate and Spygate and such. Uh, but uh, you know, these, these lawyers are being allowed to run amok uh, and do whatever they want in terms of obstructing our efforts to get the truth, as both the courts want and the law requires. Tom, tell me a little bit about this new lawsuit that you're pursuing uh, in Santa Clara uh, versus their sanctuary policy. That, that's kind of a new, 
new thing that you guys are Look, Santa Clara County, San Jose, California, has this sanctuary policy that allows illegal alien criminals to be released onto the streets. It led to an infamous murder recently. They pretended to amend their sanctuary policy by saying the feds need a judicial arrest warrant before they'll keep any criminal aliens in detention for the feds. And all the feds are asking for when the ICE uh, asks a locality to hold someone is you know hold this person or give us a heads up for a day or two so we can figure out whether we want to take them into our custody and deport them or not and they're letting these folks out so that you've got this carnage on the streets as a result of these sanctuary policies and specifically in Santa Clara so we have a taxpayer lawsuit taxpayers can sue in California to stop uh, the expenditure of tax dollars on illegal activity so we allege these sanctuary policies are illegal, contravention of federal law and other, other uh, specifications in the case. You can see that online at our website at judicialwatch.org. So uh, we're, we're, we're battling it directly. We already have a lawsuit, a similar lawsuit against the San Francisco Sheriff's Department trying to stop that sanctuary policy. And that goes to trial or is scheduled for trial in uh, early part of next year. So we've been looking at this issue for a long time. We've been pressing back on these sanctuary policies because these sanctuary policies, uh, you know, you can have a wall, and, but it won't be, work as well as it otherwise would if every major city and every major county has essentially a welcome sign for criminal illegal aliens. You come here, we'll protect you. In fact, we'll aid and abet you in terms of you're trying to avoid uh, the consequences of your criminal behavior, both as an illegal alien and even worse. Uh, so uh, it's important someone take a stand against this because the Justice Department, and the most they've done is threaten to cut off uh, funding that is largely immaterial to especially these big cities that don't need it anyway. And you know, so just to be clear, you know, we're talking about people who are actually, you know, convicted felons? Yeah, these are folks who are arrested for reasons other than being an illegal alien. They've committed right. crimes, some which are pretty significant, and they get released uh, despite federal deten uh, detainer requests. In, this, in the case of this man who murdered this poor woman, I think ICE had requested, uh, uh, had sent six requests that all were ignored, all of which were ignored by Santa Clara. I mean, it just, it, it's, it seems bizarre, I mean, that you would release someone who's a criminal. Well, these sanctuary policies are not only illegal, uh, but they're dangerous. So we in Montgomery County, which is a major uh, county uh, just outside of uh, Washington, D.C. here, I mean, they've had five or six arrests of illegal aliens accused of raping women, and many of whom would, not, what, would have been deported but for their detention, but for their sanctuary policy. So these sanctuary policies, uh, I, um, it's extremely frustrating because, you know, the, the left pretends these policies are helping people. No. It places innocents at risk. I mean, criminal illegal aliens, they victimize everyone in the community, but most especially those uh, in the illegal alien community. So if you support illegal aliens here in the United States, and we can argue about that, I mean, can't we all agree we want the predators among them deported? Right. I mean, it, again, it, it, it doesn't seem like it, there's a lot of room for debate in this one. But there's this open right. borders fanaticism that places uh, the ideology and the, and the politics before the public safety. And people are getting killed, raped, maimed, and otherwise brutalized as a result of these sanctuary policies. They need to stop. And we're trying to uh, do our part by suing in Santa Clara County and San Francisco on behalf of taxpayers who are outraged by this. Okay, well, fantastic, Tom Fitton. Such a pleasure to have you again. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.